Imagine a world where doctors help you get healthy and not just respond to your sickness. A world where experts empower you to feel good and bring peace, joy, and love to yourself and the world. An integrative approach to health. Dr. Arlene DeHomko is on a mission to wake medicine up and raise the bar of health with her show, The Multidimensional MD. Call 678-495-4345 to talk to her live on air. Or put your comments on Facebook Live at UI Media Network with your questions, concerns, suggestions, or just to say hello. Don't forget to like and share and spread the message as she helps activate the natural healing force within all of us. Let's join Dr. Arlene DeHomko in bringing spirit back to medicine on the Multidimensional MD. Hi, I'm Dr. Arlene Dianco, your host for the Multidimensional MD, Waking Up Medicine. Thank you so much for being here. I love bringing the intangible aspects of health that help you go about to get a deeper level of healing. And we have a great show for you today. It's Reiki Medicine and Self-Care. I have an amazing friend with me, Pamela Miles. She's a pioneer in Reiki. She brought Reiki practice to healthcare, and she's worked with the National Institute of Health, with Harvard, Yale, Columbia, so many hospitals. I met her when I was in my residency in New York City, and um, we have just like touched base again and, and been able to connect, and we have so much to share with you today. Um, Pamela is really great at simplifying, um, simp like just being able to speak with elegance about spirit and bringing spirit to your health. She's known for sharing spiritual insights with simple direct elegance and for her preference for continued inquiry over easy answers. So welcome, Pamela. Thank you for joining me here. Oh, Arlene, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really my pleasure. I always love hanging out with you. Yes, and everyone gets to join us here live and be in our conversation here. If you have any questions, um, we will we will be able to answer those after this podcast. But so, Pamela, how did you first learn about Reiki practice? I had heard about it for a number of years. This was so long ago that the way I heard about it was I saw signs on telephone poles in New York City, and it intrigued me, but I was not going to call a phone number that was hung on a telephone call in New York City. And then um, when I was pregnant with Her Highness and His Majesty was five years old, a friend of mine took the class, the beginning class, and she knew that I was wondering how I was going to be able to continue my spiritual practices because I, I was already a professional healer and a meditation teacher and how I was going to be able to, you know, continue that lifestyle of practice with two young children. So she said to me, um, you know, can I give you a treatment? I think you're going to like this. And of course, she was really right because no sooner had she put her hands on my head then I began to experience, you know, subtle pulsations and um, a, a sense of a cascade happening within me and feeling very indrawn and peaceful, all experiences that I was very accustomed to from my spiritual practices, mm -hmm. um, especially meditation and lying in Shavasana, you know, after my yoga practice, but also from other healing modalities. And, and then you somehow were able to bring this Bridget over to medicine and bring Reiki to medicine. That's phenomenal. Um, that integration and that, that crossover, how did that come about? I was invited. <laughs> it's not something I could have ever made happen on my own. You know, this was back in the 1990s. And um, I was sure that as far as medicine was concerned, there were only two kinds of doctors, you know, the real doctors and the witch doctors. And, and I thought I knew which kind of doctor they thought I was. Mm -hmm. But I was so wrong. You know, actually, in conventional medicine, 
and especially in HIV AIDS medicine, which is mm -hmm. um, the specialty that invited me to create the first ever Reiki hospital program. You know, at that time, it was before the protease inhibitors, before the pharmaceuticals that are available to people now when uh, an AIDS diagnosis was, you know, it was kind of yeah. a death sentence. And, and so doctors, you know, they, they went into medicine to help people and there wasn't a whole lot they could do at that time. So when they heard about Reiki and, and my work, I had a program at the Gay Men's Health Crisis where I trained. And at that point it was all guys uh, because the epidemic was still very much in the gay community. Mm -hmm. And I would train uh, these guys to practice on themselves. And the doctors told me later that they started noticing that when they had patients who were doing better than would be expected, that invariably they spoke about Reiki practice and, and my program. So, so you know, it, it just is such a, um, a learning that we yeah. can have lots of preconceived ideas about who's interested in what, you know, but in fact, once I was invited into hospital, they knew somebody had vetted me. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then doctors started approaching me privately and asking me, you know, if I could help somebody in their family, if I could help them, because you know, and you know this all too well, Arlene, doctors and nurses see so much suffering yes. that they're not able to address, you know, until mm -hmm. contemporary times, spirituality and medicine were intertwined. And our doctors were also spiritual practitioners. And, mm -hmm. and now, you know, we expect our doctors to function without that support. It's true. Yeah. yeah. We've, te and, we've teased apart like the mind, emotion, the spirit and body are like all separate. We have the psychologist, we have psychiatrists, but then that's separate from like physical medicine. This is the way medicine's set up right now. And then yeah. spiritual health is considered something completely different. Uh, but I want to back up when you said that the doctors approached you from their patients. Um, what I'm just curious because I'm so thankful that they did that because so often um, patients will have like these um, amazing um, uh, results, but sometimes the physicians are not actually interested in following up to see what they did, what happened, what could have contributed to their success. So um, I'm curious, like what kind of physicians were interested? Was it the infectious disease? Was it the internist? These were the infectious disease specialists, which um, is where guys and eventually, uh -huh. you know, women who were diagnosed with HIV AIDS were getting their care because if they were called AIDS doctors, nobody would go yeah. to them, right? right. So um, they were infectious disease specialists. And I think the key was that they weren't going in and saying, I'm cured of AIDS. They were going uh -huh. in and saying things like, I'm sleeping better. You know, I'm not oh. arguing with my roommate as often. Uh -huh. I, um, I'm able to show up for work. You know, it, uh -huh. it was that uh, their quality of life and their productivity was improving and improving gradually. So doctors, as you well know, are very uh -huh. suspicious of miracle stories when people attribute it to one particular thing because all doctors have seen people who have healed for mm -hmm. no apparent conventional medical reason. They know that there are these uh, extraordinary patients, as I believe Bernie Siegel um, coined that phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell uh, the Reiki professionals that I train, you know, keep your miracle stories to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> because if if it's unbelievable nobody's going to be interested but what really makes a difference <clears throat> excuse me in somebody's life is how they feel moment to moment mm. yeah and, and, and these 
but I'm so, I'm so like, I have so much gratitude for those infectious disease physicians that really took that notice of that. And we, even when we think about infectious disease, um, I mean, we think about the situation now with COVID-19, you know, um, labeling it just an infectious process when there's so much more to it than that. And then what you're talking about with these HIV patients, um, you know, it's an infectious infectious disease, but there's so much more to it. There is the, the, how they feel, how they are able to communicate with other people, how they're able to sleep. And, um, those are sometimes like those intangible aspects that really help them feel better overall. Not only do they help them feel better, but they also have really strong implications for their immunity. You know, and this is one mm -hmm. of the the problems um, that we're seeing now is that people are mostly only paying attention to the outer hygiene. Yes. You know, and that's good. That's important. But it's also making them extremely anxious. Mm -hmm. You know, and what happens when we're anxious, when we're frightened, is our cortisol tends to spike. And that depresses our immune response. So it just doesn't make sense to put the different parts of us in, mm -hmm. in different silos and, um, and not look at the whole picture. Because this, this isn't um, some kind of obscure science or medicine I'm talking about. You know, this is contemporary neuroscience. This is well mm -hmm. known. Mm -hmm. in conventional medicine. And, and conventional doctors understand that the spiritual aspect of a person's being is important to their well-being. It's just not what they do. Right. But if people start to open up to that and other physicians and healthcare practitioners, um, if they can learn how to start to address that or at least incorporate um, you know, things and, and, and people that can help with that, that would really help to shift medicine. Now, you've been involved in Reiki research with the NIH and have published articles on Reiki. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, yes, uh, I'd love to. And again, I was invited, you know, and I remember <laughs> very well, I'd been asked about a year before to do an overview, an information piece, and, and reviewing what um, research was available on Reiki practice. And this must have been 2001, um, because in 2002, when I took my daughter to boarding school and I came home, <laughs> that's when I was finally able to write the paper. Because for me as a layperson, to write a peer-reviewed medical paper was a huge undertaking mm -hmm. and, um, and pretty stress invoking, <laughs> I must say. Yeah. Um, but it all came out of the work that I'd done, you know, and, and the fact that doctors saw that I was reasonable, that I wasn't making wild claims and, and there were researchers and doctors and nurses who were interested in Reiki practice, but it was hard to find somebody where there wasn't a huge language and cultural divide. So uh -huh. um, it was, I, I kind of had a captive audience, you know, um, and that led to me teaching at Yale Medical School. And while there, we did a study on um, Reiki practice for people who had had a heart attack in the last 72 hours. And this is a very critical time because mm -hmm. the system is crashed. And, and then if there's another heart attack, um, the person doesn't have resources to be able to sustain it. Uh -huh. So improving a, an objective measure called heart rate variability is very important in that period. And that's why beta blockers are given. But we found that a 20 minute Reiki treatment from nurses in the uh, cardiac ICU improved heart rate variability comparable uh -huh. to beta blockers. And the study was published in the journal of the American College of Cardiology, which is the top peer-reviewed um, conventional cardiology journal. 
That's amazing. And I know in medicine, we're always talking about evidence-based. Well, there we have some evidence. And so um, to be open to use, actually using evidence-based medicine. So we are going to take a quick break here. This is Dr. Arlene Diamco, the multidimensional MD, talking to Reiki pioneer Pamela Miles. And I want to just say hello, friends, at WDJY 99.1 FM and WTTA 101.2 FM in Kentucky, Ohio. We will be right back talking to Reiki pioneer Pamela Miles about mind, body, and especially spirit. Stay tuned. At Heiser Orthodontics, we understand that your smile is a big deal for both kids and adults. We have the latest technology and state-of-the-art equipment. But honestly, what makes us unique is our patient experience. And we are not the only people saying this. Heiser Orthodontics is amazing. Superb. Trustworthy. Compassionate. A friendly place where they know what they're doing, and that's what I like about it. We are a family-owned private practice where kids are valued, parents have a voice, and the entire Heiser team puts the patient first. Discover the Heiser orthodontics difference. Call 470-330-9083 for a free consultation today. Hi, welcome back to the Multidimensional MD. This is Dr. Arlene Diamco here with Reiki pioneer, Pamela Miles. We were just talking about her NIH study um, that was also published in the American College of Cardiology. Uh, what was it? American the Journal, the Journal. Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Cardi and it was a, a Yale study, not in that Yale one study. was in an NIH okay. study. So Yale study, but I, I love that it was in this um, prestigious peer-reviewed journal. And here you have um, this evidence that, that Reiki can help with um, with patients after surgery and well, with heart rate variability. What's so important about that is that heart rate variability is an indication of a system that is either crashing as, it's, uh, as the heart rate variability is dropping or as it's normalizing of a system that is building and um, is capable of self-healing. So mm -hmm. it's something that is, of course, important for cardiac patients, but it's important for yeah. all of us. And the study also showed that for the most part, the research has been looking in the wrong place, you know, to research the benefits of a practice like Reiki. We want to look at the response and the response to Reiki practice is that the system moves toward a more balanced state. And mm -hmm. in, in medical language, you know, that would be parasympathetic dominance rather than the sympathetic overdrive, the fight mm -hmm. or flight. And in that state, which is the state that our bodies were made to spend most of our time in, you know, our bodies are capable of self-repair and our minds are balanced and steady. So we feel better, we function better, and we make better choices. Now, a common question that I get with Reiki practice is that, is Reiki associated with a religion? Reiki practice is not associated with any religion whatsoever. It's a completely um, lay, non-denominational, non-dogmatic spiritual practice in the sense that meditation, for example, is non-denominational. You know, there are many religions that include meditative practices, but you can meditate or practice Reiki without having any belief system. You just need to be willing to practice in a sense to be your own uh, laboratory and, and see for yourself what value is there. Mm -hmm. And is it is it a spiritual practice? Yes, it is a spiritual practice in the sense that spirituality is um, 
all of life that can't be measured in a sense, um, but that contributes to our sense of well-being and our sense of agency and our recognition of meaning in life, mm -hmm. our resourcefulness. Like we, we speak about inner resources. Well, what are those inner resources? That's our spiritual self. So again, there's no religion attached to it, although many mm -hmm. religions will speak about one's spiritual self. You can also engage with yourself on a spiritual level without having any belief system um, attached to it. And that's where practices like Reiki become particularly valuable. Although I have to say, I have trained people who are, um, you know, who have very strong faith connection mm -hmm. in all the major uh, religious streams. And they invariably have told me that their Reiki self-practice has brought them to a deeper understanding and a direct experience of their religion. You know, whereas wow. the yeah. belief the belief that they had opened into a direct experience. So they found it very enhancing and not at all contradicting their religious beliefs. Okay. I, yeah. I love that. Um, that it just, it felt, they felt more connected with themselves, yeah. with their own spirit. And then they were able to feel more connected with their religion as well. And these are all different denominations. To you, what's the difference between spirituality and religion? Uh, that's really pretty simple. It's a matter of dogma. Religions are defined by dogma, which is a set of beliefs. You know, so if you're Jewish, you have this set of dogma. You know, if you're Christian, you have a different set. If you're Muslim, you have a different set. And um, and for some people, that's very empowering and very meaningful, mm -hmm. but not for everybody. Yeah. So in a sense, even though it may not feel like it to people who have a strong faith base, we could say that in a sense, religion is optional, mm -hmm. you know, meaning that you don't have to have a religious belief, a religious attachment, but spirituality really isn't optional you know, it's an inherent part of being human. Like we mm -hmm. have bodies. We don't have to be athletes to have bodies, right? You know, mm -hmm. we don't have to be um, intellectuals to know that we have minds and intellect. And we don't have to be drama queens to know that we're emotional beings. So in the same way, we are inherently spiritual mm -hmm. beings and it's up to us if we want to develop any or all of those aspects of ourselves. It's true. We don't choose to be spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings. Okay. Um, and so um, to me, spirit is, and spirituality is more all-encompassing and um, even greater than religion because it embraces everyone. And more that oneness and that unity of like, yeah, we are all spiritual beings and we don't, nothing we can do can change that. You probably have heard this quote that I love so much by a French Jesuit, um, a, a Catholic mystic of the 1900s, Théard de Chardin. And he said, we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. Uh. We're spiritual beings having a human experience. And spiritual practices like Reiki, like meditation, you know, like prayer, I mean, there's so many of them, but it's through spiritual practice that we can transform our primary identification with ourselves from being human first. And, and being human means being extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. and limited mm -hmm. to being spirit first and spirit incarnate. So we have, as you said, that experience of oneness is within us. And in this life, we are manifesting as an individual. 
-hmm. So spiritual practice can enable us to live in the world as a strong individual whose life and choices are informed by the inner spiritual experience of oneness, which changes everything. You know, we're, we don't so easily take advantage of other people or of the planet mm -hmm. when we have a felt experience of oneness. You know, the, the feeling that some people get, that people often get in nature if they're still long enough, where you know, yes, that's a tree over there. I'm not the tree, but on another level, I am the tree. You know? that's, that's such a loving and harmonious way to approach life and um, being able to create intentions and to act from that perspective of, of true connection and balance with yourself and others and the planet. Um, so, yeah, I mean, how do you, how does Reiki help you get to know yourself? You know, Arlene, you just used my favorite word, balance. <laughs> and, and Reiki practice, I mean, the, the foundation of Reiki practice is to learn to practice on yourself. That's not the part that is spoken about as often as it should be. But I learned to practice Reiki in 1986, and I've practiced on myself in bed before I'm ready to get out of bed, you know, as I'm just awakening every morning since then. Mm -hmm. And that means that by the time I'm ready to sit up and go into my active day, I am in a balanced state. So I feel good about myself. I feel good about my life. My body is functioning as well as it can in that situation. And when there is something that I need to take a look at, you know, because uh -huh. we all have those moments where it's like, Absolutely. oh, I can't believe uh -huh. I said that. Or, oh, no, I forgot, you know, I was going to do this. I, I didn't keep my word, whatever it is. I mean, I, I don't know. I mess up. Uh -huh. I don't know about other people, but yes. I know I mess up and I make mistakes. And when I'm balanced, number one, I make fewer mistakes. But I'm still going to make mistakes. I'm a mm -hmm. human being. And when I'm balanced, I can look at that, you know, okay. and yeah. I can... I can forgive myself. I could forgive the person who has made a mistake that has hurt me. And I can be honest with my emotions. I can express them in a way that is meaningful and not hurtful. And mm -hmm. I can let go. I can heal and, and transform. You, you know, like I'm huh? sure, Arlene, you've heard so many people talking now that we're hopefully moving out of confinement, people are often saying, you know, I want to go back to the way my life was. I'm, I want to get through this. I just want to get through this. But we don't want yeah. to just get through anything. We always want to grow and, and open to more profound experience mm -hmm. of ourselves and of life. And when we live in a balanced state, when we have the capacity to bring ourselves back to balance, then we can transform instead of just gritting our teeth and burying it. That's a really great way to look at it and to know that we are, what we're going through right now is, is transformation. And um, not to go back to business as usual, that we have so much more um, that we can be and we can we can heal so much more ourselves and others. It's a an amazing opportunity right now. And even though things feel difficult often for many people, um, I like to assume that any part of my day, my um, eat from moment to moment is part of a healing process. And so that every step that you're taking is, is part of your own healing. It's the whole, the journey of living. And that when we, um, 
not to get through the COVID um, and quarantine, but when we emerge, it's like emerging from that cocoon and we are transformed and we will be those butterflies. And, and I love that you start your day with a Reiki self-embrace. <laughs> That's a, a really great way to connect with your heart center so that you can take steps in the day and to connect with others and, um, and spread love throughout the world. We're going to take another quick break here. And this is Dr. Arlene Diamco, the multidimensional MD, talking to Reiki pioneer, Pamela Miles. And we will be right back talking about Love Myself Reiki, a free online movement um, that you can join. And if you can watch and listen to all exclusive and uncensored content 24 seven on uimediaapp.com. If you have any questions, you could also call in at 678-495-4345. We'll be right back in just a moment. This is Kurt Arsno of Arsno Advisory Group. Do you make a six-figure income but live paycheck to paycheck? You're not alone. Many six-figure income households will buy too much home and too much car, creating tremendous financial stress that builds debt when you should be building wealth. If you make six figures and live paycheck to paycheck, visit arsenaladvisory.com and download our free ebook titled, I Make Six Figures and Live Paycheck to Paycheck. You have nothing to lose and potentially everything to gain. Visit arsenaladvisory.com today. Hi, thanks for watching The Multidimensional MD. I'm your host, Dr. Arlene Diamco. I'm talking to Reiki pioneer, Pamela Miles. And we were talking about Reiki in spirit. And um, Pamela has started an amazing free online group where you can join in and experience self Reiki practice for yourself. So Pamela, can you tell us more about that? This is something that I started in early March. I had been traveling for most of uh, the first two months of the year. And when I came back from Curacao, I could see that the pandemic was going to reach us and it was going to reach us and hit us hard and that people would need support. And, you know, that they, that, that the news that was starting to be shared was frightening to most people because they don't have an understanding of maintaining their state. They don't have an understanding of um, living in a health promoting way. So I started offering sessions twice a week on Tuesdays and Saturdays, 45 minutes, and we practice self Reiki together. I was first of all thinking of the Reiki community, anybody who had had some Reiki training, but in fact, people started showing up who had no Reiki training and then emailing me what a great experience they had. And, you know, and I, I remembered when I wrote my book, Reiki, a Comprehensive Guide, people started showing up in class saying, I started practicing Reiki from your book. And, you know, I always thought, did you read the part where it says you can't learn how to practice Reiki from a book, <laughs> you know, but I never said it because they were so excited and they were benefiting so much. And I gradually came to understand that what people were doing then and what people were doing with these free sessions was taking some time for themselves. And they'd move their hands through this series of placements. I always guide people and and so their nervous systems were responding they were settling down they were feeling safe and and um by the end of the 40 minutes you know they were in a a different state now i, I always say to my students take care of your state and your state takes care of everything else this is something that's so simple and so radical in our culture where most people aren't even sure what I mean when I say your state, <laughs> you know, but it's just like checking in with yourself. How do I feel right now? Hmm. 
And, and so at the end of the, the practice, that's what I ask people. The same way I ask my clients, you know, at the end of a session, how do you feel right now? Like, realize you could always feel this good and maybe even better. But you came to one, didn't you? I did. So I tell did. us about your experience. It was amazing. It was, it was, I loved that to be able to practice in a group. A lot of times I will practice on my own. Um, in a group, to me, first I kind of tuned in just like the world in general. And, you know, right now with COVID-19, there is just so much fear and static and just this uh, like overall kind of frenzy feeling, like feels like this to me, kind of quivery. Um, and so through the, pra the group practice, it's like I could imagine that there were these little lights kind of lighting up all over the world, creating this whole network of light. And it was just like a big hug to the whole world and including yourself too. Um, and so as, at, through the practice, through the, um, the group, then by the end, when I kind of checked in with that whole kind of global feel, I was like, oh, it seemed to have like calm some. And I thought, wow, if everyone got together to do something like that regularly, which is what you're doing, how much that could help heal the world, yourself, it has to start with yourself, of course. So you show up for yourself. But in doing so, it really helps everybody. Because if I can walk out from there feeling more at peace, um, more balance my, my mind, just a bit calmer, um, then I can help other people even more, whether it's my family or patients and my practice. And, and that's why I love to have some kind of practice like this um, to do regularly, to tune into yourself and to take a moment to really be with yourself. And that way, that that to me is like a true like depth of healing that impacts all layers of health physical mental emotional spiritual and um yeah it was really lovely thank you you know it, it, the point you made about when i take care of myself then i have more to give others is a very valid point however i want to take it deeper because people often say, well, I have to take care of myself so I can help other people. It's not a two-step process. <laughs> when I take care of myself, when I explore my inner being and discover who I truly am, I am taking care of other people mm -hmm. because we're all broadcasting. You know, and we know this, uh, and especially in New York City, where I live, it's easy to know this because you get on a bus or a train and you just don't want to sit next to that person. And, and outwardly, the person looks just fine, you mm -hmm. know, but you can feel their broadcast and you don't have to be a psychic to feel this. Mm -hmm. I think people sense so much more than they give themselves credit for, mm -hmm. you know, or they walk into a restaurant and we will be able to walk into restaurants again. Absolutely. And we we don't want to sit at that table where the hostess is telling us, you know, and we ask, could could we sit over there? Because we feel a difference. And often we don't pay attention because we can't make sense out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Everything doesn't have to make sense. It's like we can come to our senses when we're still inside, when we're aware of our, our inner resources, we can start letting that guide us. And that broadcast that we give out when we've tended to ourselves is uplifting to the world, mm -hmm. not just the people that we actually come in contact with, but beyond that in ways that we may not be able to understand right now. So that's what I was aiming for in the I Love Myself Reiki practice sessions. And, and I will continue to offer them, you know, because the way out is in. 
Uh and getting getting people to consider, oh, I could drop inside Uh and find the healing that is available to me there, you know, find my inner nourishment. Um, That that takes some, that takes getting people's attention (laughs) and, and some support. So that's why I do these programs. And what else have you heard from people joining in these groups? Oh, people have told me, uh, and many of these people are people who haven't even taken a Reiki training, although some of them... That's incredible. I mean, you have about <laughs> like 10,000 yeah, people. Yeah, we're, we're closing in on 10,000 people yeah. from 87 countries. And some of them have signed up to take my video conference, you know, my small group live interactive Reiki trainings, but many of them have not trained. And they, they tell me that the practice sessions and practicing on their own at home has been their mainstay through this period. You know, it's helped them out of their, their feelings of depression and to climb out of the hopelessness and the fear and anxiety that was keeping them up at night that they're able to sleep now. And, you know, some people, people who have had digestive problems have said that that's gone away, you know, or has lessened or or people will email me after a session and say, I started with a headache and it's gone now. You know, the, the responses are going to be different for different people because Reiki practice is balancing. And that's the important part to keep in mind. You know, that Reiki practice Mm -hmm. is balancing. So we're going to notice the benefits where we had pain, where we were unbalanced. And we tend to be unbalanced in the direction of being stressed in this culture. But even with that, you know, broadly speaking, we experience stress in different places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And... um and how, if anyone wanted to join, how could they sign up for that? Oh, it's very simple. I put a, a red banner across the top of my website and you can click there and it will take you to the page that always has the next two um, sessions registration links. And my to find my website, you can Google my name, Pamela miles with an i and reiki r-e-i-k-i and that will take you to a list of things probably but the top one should be my website which is reiki in medicine.org and then you see that red banner and click on that and it's it's pretty easy it sounds like there's so many amazing benefits with a reiki practice are there any precautions with practicing Reiki? Thank you for asking that. It's a very important question. And this is something that I've been addressing in medical environments since the mid 90s. Mm. And this is what I say, and it has always been well received. And, and, you know, doctors would let me know if I were making claims. There are no known medical contraindications to Reiki practice. There is no time when it's thought to be dangerous as long as people are being sensible and getting whatever medical care they need. But the reason why it's considered safe is that Reiki is practiced through light touch. It's non-manipulative. It's not like a massage. You're just placing your hand. And if need be, you can lift your hand above. So if there's a burn, for example, you don't even have to touch. And we're not asking people to swallow anything, nor are we putting anything on their skin because we ingest things we put on our skin. So according to the conventional medical model, there's nothing about Reiki practice that is potentially dangerous. But then also the conventional medical model is um, it's dualistic. It's it's, mm -hmm oppositional you know you get a symptom and then you push the symptom back Mm -hmm. but the spiritual practice model the reiki model is holistic it's balance and 
there's no time when balance is thought to be dangerous. Balance is always a good idea in medicine. It's called homeostasis. That's really great to know. And um, what you said, you've been saying this since the 1990s in hospitals to physicians, and it's been well received. Um, and that speaks volumes that it's been, I, I see it on many different hospital websites. Now, if they have an integrative and wellness mm -hmm. program um, integrated into their, their health systems from cancer to infectious disease to um, surgery, so many things. We have to take another quick break here. Thank you all for joining. You are watching the Multidimensional MD Waking Up Medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Arlene Dianco, and talking to Reiki pioneer, Pamela Mile. We will be right back talking about healthy boundaries. See you in just a moment. Hi, I'm Greta Fole president of Golden Home Services, a premier private home care service for seniors in Georgia for almost two decades now. We all have parents, and I know I love my parents more than anything else in this world. And because of that, Golden Home Services makes sure we care for your parents as if they were our parents. Call 678-242-0084 anytime or visit goldenhomeservices.com to select from our range of affordable home care services. Welcome back. You're watching the Multidimensional MD. Thank you for helping us wake up medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Arlene Dianco, and I'm talking to my good friend here, Reiki pioneer, and also integrative health practitioner, Pamela Miles. So Pamela, you love to talk about um, creating healthy boundaries. It's such an important topic for overall balance and health. What, what does that actually mean? What is a healthy, compassionate boundary? You know, there's no formula for it, but we know it when it's happening, you know? And so as a, a beginning exercise, I encourage people, if they're unsure of their boundaries in any given moment, just to start flexing the large muscles of their body like the glutes, those are real easy. Those are the muscles you're sitting on people. And when you flex them, it makes you a little higher, a little taller in your chair. And if you flex and hold for even 15, 20, 30 seconds, it's going to bring your awareness to your physical form. And our physical bodies have very clear boundaries. You know, it's on emotional and psycho-spiritual levels that we're not always so clear where the boundaries are. So if you feel that your boundaries are not so strong in the moment, if you're, how would you know that? You're feeling spacey, you're feeling intimidated. You know, we all have our own uh, responses and this is a good thing for people to discover for themselves mm -hmm. because that's a cue that it's time to start flexing those muscles. You know, you can even do your biceps, but your uh, quads are another very large muscle group. Those are the muscles in the, the top of your thighs. Mm -hmm. And um, they're easier to do one at a time. And it can be amazing how much better you feel. You know, you lose that kind of woozy feeling that is, I, I got to get out of here feeling. Well, uh -huh. getting out of here may be a good idea, but you're safer getting in your body, you know, being really grounded in your body before you get out of someplace. <laughs> So this is not just boundaries in terms of like with other people or spaces, but also a boundary with your 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 physical being and your like spiritual kind of energetic being and your mind i'm so glad you brought that up because people tend to go to relationships when mm -hmm. they first think of boundaries yep. and and too often they think that boundaries are something that other people should have better <laughs> you know should yeah. be better at <clears throat> but it's interesting how when we start being aware of our boundaries. It's not so much setting them, they're not arbitrary, but being aware of them and feeling when we start to get uncomfortable and then having a few things that we can do, like the, the um, exercise that I just 
mentioned, but it's also with our minds. You know, uh-huh. we need to have boundaries with our minds. For example, you don't let yourself think of horrible things that might happen. You just don't do that. There's nothing that is going to be gained by doing that. So if you notice that your mind is spiraling, <clears throat> you go to something that is uplifting for you. And th- this is very individual. For me, um, there is a, a, an aria in um, La Fille du Regiment and Pavarotti sang it so beautifully. And there's nine high C's. And, and a high C is a very heartfelt sound. And I listened to that and uh, there's no drug in the world that could change my mood as fast as listening to Oh Mes Amis is the name of it in case anybody wants to look it up. But we know what makes us feel good. You know, we Uh know what uplifts us and it's individual. And the trick is to have a few things around so we can turn to them easily. For someone, it may be a scent, like having some lovely um, Bulgarian rose essential uh-huh. oil uh-huh. You know, that you could just put a touch on your finger and, and smell it. it. Again, it's very of the heart. So you know we're going to be listening to that song right after this. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I'm still on the song. We'll, we'll put a link out to you so everyone can, can click on that. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what you remind me of that, that healthy boundaries is it's really being aware of you and yourself. And yes. I feel this a lot as um, a cranial osteopath and integrative um, physician is that it's like, if people have these huge fields, your big heart field, your energetic field, um, and then they can pick up a lot of static in the world. And so it's like things just kind of like get stuck on them. But that means that you don't have a clear sense of your own boundary, because if you did uh, more clarity for yourself, that those things just wouldn't stick because you'd be like, you would know who you are and you would know that you're this amazing, loving being of light and love. And there would be no need to pick up on all of that static. And it also reminds me of like, of, of parenting in a positive and loving way because um, parenting, when the when it's a baby, they need much smaller boundaries to keep their world safe. And then as the child grows bigger, the toddlers, you know, you can ha- they get to roam more, but they still have this clear boundary. You don't let them go touch a hot stove or you know fall against a hard edge. And then these ever expanding boundaries, like as we grow too. Um, But what you said about like not, not kind of like keeping a boundary for your mind, like, you know, this way, this is a better way to kind of like a feel good way um, so that you don't hurt yourself. It doesn't mean that you can't heal from that. But, um, but, but why do that when there's an, an, a more fun and a way of ease? Yeah, you know, when we feel good about ourselves, we have good boundaries. And this is really the difference because most people approach boundaries in a defensive mode. I'm going to keep you out. I'm going to keep you out, you know, and they confuse their heart and their emotions. Mm -hmm. Whereas the emotions are not of the spiritual heart. The emotions kind of orbit the heart. You know, you have to be able to get through the emotional fields to be able to experience how strong your heart is But once you do that, and spiritual practice helps, and this is something that we do in in the program that I'm about to start, Blessed Boundaries, you know, because living in your heart, living from your heart, expressing from your heart, grounded in your heart, you're not a wimp, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know, you're not an emotional wreck. You're loving, and you're strong, and you're clear. And it's like, don't tread on me. It's not, don't tread on me. <laughs> you know, it's just, don't tread on me. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and and you, you understand that that's your job. You know, part of being an individual is, in a sense, to protect other people from hurting you. 
because when we let people hurt you, and I'm not, this is not blaming the victim. I'm not saying that everybody who has ever been hurt, that it's their fault, not at all. But I'm talking about this, the small ways in which we let people hurt us, you know, because we don't want to say no to them because we're afraid of hurting their feelings. Mm -hmm. So learning how to decline the invitation without rejecting the person graciously you know? yeah yes like like taking the person's hand whether it's virtually or in person and saying thank you so much for thinking of me and wanting to share this with me and i'm not uh, available to do that but thank mm -hmm. you i really appreciate it and let's plan something else that's a very now i see the compassion for yourself and the other pe person um, and yeah, that is a <laughs> healthy, compassionate boundary for sure. And it's a very feel good. It, um, it's your relationship with yourself, your relationship with others. Um, and uh, it helps you actually be able to forgive as well. Absolutely. You know, because the more honest we are with ourselves, the, the more we can see when we mess up as we were talking about before you know like when i was younger i never made a mistake <laughs> <laughs> and now that i'm grown up i make mistakes all the time <laughs> uh -huh. and, and once i realized it was okay to make mistakes and you know i was joking about that right uh -huh. but once i realized it was okay to make mistakes i started getting so much more productive uh -huh. you know uh -huh. and 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 willing to access and express my creativity and that's how i came up with you know these online interactive programs that i have which are a little bit like living in a virtual ashram you know that you you go through your life as, as your life is and you just put some time aside every day for your spiritual practice and then when you can, you come online in this private part of my website and we interact online. So we don't have to be aligned with time zones, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's always this feeling like, okay, my life is going as usual. And there's this incredible spiritual support because there's also an international community of people who are engaged in the program at the same time. And it's, it's, it's always um, so sweet to watch people wow. transform their self-concept and, and realize they don't yeah. have to protect themselves from themselves. They can be themselves and experience the love in their hearts and have space for the mistakes that invariably happen they can ask forgiveness and they can give forgiveness and let go and carry on. That's an amazing sacred space you've created for an international community. If anyone would like to look into that, it does start this Friday. And Pamela, can you tell people how to sign up for that if they'd like to? Yeah, you could just Google um, Blessed Boundaries. B-L-E-S-S-E-D, boundaries. Um, that alone will probably take you to the page or go to PamelaMiles.com. Mm -hmm. And then you'll see the link for Blessed Boundaries there. And if you have any questions at all about it, the best way to reach me, the fastest way to reach me is to use the contact form on either of my websites. Well, thank you so much, Pamela. We are running out of time here. I know we could talk for so much longer, but thank you for being here with me. This is Dr. Arlene Diamko, the multidimensional MD, Waking Up Medicine. Join me next time in a couple of weeks with my next guest, Dr. Chris Lassiter for meditative exercises. Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Arlene. Thank you all. Lots of love to everyone. Wow, what a show. I feel great already. Don't you all look at health in a whole new light now? If you do, 
please don't forget to like, comment, and share the show. And you can also watch all of Dr. Arlene's shows on uimediaapp.com. Catch her live every other Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern on WDJY 99.1 FM in Atlanta, Facebook Live, Spreaker, and almost all the podcasting platforms at UI Media Network. You can also write to her at contact at uimedianetwork.org with your questions, concerns, and comments. Like Hippocrates says, everyone has a doctor in him or her. We just have to help it in its work. And Dr. Arlene is here to do just that. The United Intentions Foundation and its associates take no responsibility for the opinions and statements made by the talk show hosts or their guests.